Hello, it's Jeffrey Christian of CPM Group. It's 10 minutes after 11 o'clock in the morning of Friday, the 26th of July here in New York. Gold's trading around $2,382. Uh, right now, silver is trading around $27.80, uh, $27.80. The silver is bouncing around. Gold has, generally speaking, been higher today. Uh, we've seen, we're going to talk about gold and silver prices right now, the resilience of gold, the vulnerability of silver relative to gold. And I want to talk a little bit about politics to sort of give some background there. Uh, this week, we've seen some interesting developments. Last week, the developments were political. This week, we've had some pretty decent economic factors and uh, data coming out. In fact, st much stronger than people believe. Real GDP for the second quarter, uh, the, the latest count is 2.8% uh, growth. Real GDP, that's extremely strong. Uh, it's much higher than the 1% that uh, consensus forecasts had it at. It's much higher than what CPM Group had. At this point, there is a growing consensus of a number of economists are saying, well, maybe we do affect a soft landing in the U.S. economy and we don't have a recession. CPM Group has been wrestling with this issue all week, and we've been talking among ourselves about it. Um, our view is that a recession is m more likely to be later than this year. We had thought that there could be a recession in the second half of 2024 or 2025. Um, a recession emerging yet in this year seems far less likely given the strength that we're seeing. We are still not of the mind that there won't be a recession. There are a lot of political and economic and financial issues out there that give us cause for concern, uh, not only in the United States and Canada, but on a, on a global basis. So we're still maintaining the view that we will see a recession in the industrialized world, possibly in 2025. Uh, but that, you know, given the strength that we've seen, when we learn something new, we change our opinion. And we are seeing much greater strength in the economy this year than we had thought, and much greater strength than a lot of other people had thought. In that environment, gold is holding up very well. And I think the reason that gold is holding up very well is for the same economic view that I just laid out. A lot of people are looking at the economy. They're saying, okay, things are better than we had expected, but there are still massive issues hanging out over the economy, over global international trade, global political issues, domestic uh, political issues. And there are a lot of people who are not ready to give up the, uh, let down their guard. So gold has maintained itself above $2,300. It did get, uh, and it's risen up as high as $2,488, I believe, last week. Uh, it, uh, on Wednesday, the 17th, came down with a thud to below $2,400 on Friday. It came down even further to around $2,350 uh, over the last few days. It got down to $2,355 this morning. So there, the price of gold has held up very well because demand has been very strong around the world. Again, people ask us, where are you seeing the demand? Well, central banks have actually pulled back in the last two and a half months from the buying given the higher prices but um, and the need for Russia, uh, the Russian central bank has been sell selling a lot of gold to raise cash uh, for to support its war effort and to support its economy during the war effort and sanctions that have been imposed upon it. Um, but in terms of private investment demand, we've seen strong private investment demand pretty much around the world. Institutional demand wealthy individuals and uh, retail investors have been buying gold. There has been a pullback on the institutional side in 
physical gold purchases over the last several weeks, partly because the prices have gotten higher, partly because those institutional investment management companies have been looking at the economy and saying, hey, it's not as bad as we thought. There are a lot of problems there, but let's be honest, the economy has shown a great, greater resilience than we thought. So maybe we don't need to be so loaded up on gold. Retail investors, high net worth individuals to have maintained their interest in physical gold. You have seen and you continue to see a lot of open interest in the August uh, COMEX gold futures contract, about 30 million ounces uh, as of a couple days ago. We're still open interest in the July, uh, August contract. That suggests that somebody is going to take delivery of those futures contracts. Now, taking delivery of futures contracts does not mean taking delivery of physical gold and removing it from the depositories or removing it even from the exchange. We saw very large, about 30 million ounces, uh, silver deliveries taken in the active July silver futures contract over the course of this month. And most of that metal is still in the vaults. And in fact, the uh, amount of silver that's in the vaults has actually risen during this period of time. So there are people, institutional investors and others that are interested in having exposure to gold and exposure to gold prices uh, because they're concerned. And we're seeing this greater resilience in gold. If you turn to silver, it too has held up, but not quite as well or as strongly as has gold. There were a lot of people who thought that the price of gold, uh, silver would stay above $30 uh, once it got above $30 in the middle of May. In the, by, by early June, it was breaking below $30. It traded most of June below $30. It got back up to about $32 in the middle of July, and it's come back down. And as I said, right now, it's at $27.88. So it's flopping around uh, below $28. There is a potential that silver could fall further. And we have written in our reports to our clients that we wouldn't be surprised to see the price of silver fall to $26.50 over the course of July and August and September. And that is a real possibility. Our expectation is that the price will rise in line with gold later this year. But silver has a vulnerability that gold doesn't have. It has not performed as strongly as gold. Demand for gold from investors, a broad spectrum of the types of investors, has been stronger on a global basis than it has been for silver. So the gold market has shown greater resilience and the silver market has shown greater vulnerability to the downside. And that's actually not all that unusual. I'm gonna talk a little bit about politics. People try to guess my politics and they usually guess wrong. And I'm not going to try to explain my politics because they're very complex and don't really care to be here talking about politics. I will say that like 51% of the registered U.S. voters, I am an independent. I would never want to belong to a political party and I'm confounded and confused by people who readily identify with any political party. I mean, political parties are pretty odious to begin with. One of the worst problems that the United States politically faces is the, the, the duopoly that the Republican and Democratic parties have established over the political process. We should have nonpartisan political processes, not bipartisan political processes. But there are people who identify as Republican or Democrat, and they belong to it like a cult. And it doesn't matter who the politicians are or what they stand for. I sometimes will say to myself and to others, I am a Lincoln, Teddy Roosevelt, Eisenhower Republican in some ways. Those were three great Republicans, but that Republican party ended with Dwight David Eisenhower. It's over. Barry Goldwater, 
was an interim, but from Nixon onward, we've had a different Democratic Party. And some people are waking up to that and they're Republican Party. Some people are waking up to that and they're moving away from the Republican Party, say, oh, in the last eight, 10 years, it has changed from the Republican Party that was established in 1854 that, that carried the bodies of Lincoln and, and Teddy Roosevelt and, and, and Eisenhower, three fabulous presidents. Uh, in reality, the changes started in the 1960s. They actually start, were starting in the 1950s um, and they accelerated with Eisenhower leaving the presidency in 1960, 61. Uh, and and the problems with the Republican Party really started to emerge in the 1960s and 1970s and have just grown worse. The Democratic Party, I don't even want to talk about it. As I've said, it's almost not even a political party. It's more like a bunch of motorheads uh, on the strip mall parking lot on a Saturday night booing and eyeing how various people have checked out their cars. I mean, it's just, yeah, it's a mess. A hot mess, as the term goes these days. Uh, so that, I just don't understand the concept of loyalty to a political party. Uh, I guess I'm a Marxian in that, like uh, Groucho Marx, I, I would never belong to a club that would have me as a member. Um, I don't necessarily like clubs to begin with, and a political party is just a party it's a club with a bunch of people who I'd rather not socialize with. Now, going back to politics, fiscal responsibility is very important to me in politics. It's not just fiscal policy that matters. I care about freedom, liberty, government non-interference in personal lives, civic focus, and public service. These are what I'm looking for in politicians. Politicians believe in a fair and effective government regulations and protections against abusive behaviors. Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations in 1776 talked about the unseen hand and the importance for capitalism to have a great deal of freedom. And he also wrote extensively about the need for government to impose effective and fair regulations because the idea of a noble, noble businessman taking care of the world for themselves is nonsense, he said, he wrote. You need government, you need regulations, but you need fair and effective regulations. We don't have it. Look at beef prices in the United States. Beef on the hoof, cattle prices have fallen for 40 years. Beef in the store have risen and risen to the point where many people stopped eating beef. Why? It wasn't COVID, it wasn't supply chains. It was a long transition from 20, 30 years ago when we had 40 some odd meat packing places, slaughterhouses and meat packing places, to now where we have three or four. And they have oligarchic pricing power and they're squeezing the cattle ranchers and they're squeezing the consumers. And the government, the politicians who run the government, have contributed and allowed to that process and allowed it and even encouraged it because they get campaign contributions from those three or four guys that have those meat packing companies. And I don't want to pick on the beef industry. You can see the same process in almost every other industry, including banking. Honesty, intelligence, and knowledge. My wife always says, watching the television, watching politicians on television, I really would like to be able to vote for people who are smarter than me. We'd like to have intelligent and knowledgeable politicians running this country but we don't get them because of the selective selection process that is developed in that duopoly and the constant need for money. But let's talk about fiscal policy because that's really important. This is a chart of budget deficits and surpluses, mostly deficits, 
since 1935. And one of the key political considerations for me is fiscal conservatism. Republicans like to say that the Democrats are the party of tax and spend, and to some extent they're right. The Republican Party, since Richard Nixon, actually even before that, are the party of borrow and spend. Let our kids worry about paying for this debt. And it happens over and over again. You can see here the red bars, you know, that first appearance of a significant red bar, that was Richard Nixon. I am a Keynesian, abusing Keynes's uh, theories that when you get into a deficit, it's okay. It, when you get into a recession, it's okay for a government to run a deficit to fix and get out of that recession. To say, no, we can run deficits until the cows come home. And you can see over the course of the Nixon era, you saw a law, uh, uh, Nixon and then Reagan and then George H. Bush, you saw a large increase in budget deficits. The last budget deficit of Jimmy Carter was $58 billion deficit. And we had less than a trillion dollars worth of debt. By within three years, we were running $300, $350 billion deficits, and we were over $2 trillion in debt. Today, we're running trillions of dollars worth of deficits, and we've got $34, $35 trillion worth of debt. The last four presidents that ran budget surpluses were Clinton, those little blue uh, bars uh, on the upside, Lyndon Johnson, 1968, with his surtax, a tax on the tax. He funded the Great Society and the Vietnam War with a sur surplus. Dwight Eisenhower and Harry Truman. But with all defense, you have to say, Eisenhower had eight budgets, and six of them were deficits. He did have two, deficit, uh, two surplus years in his eight-year tenure as president. Truman ran a surplus during the Korean War. Eisenhower ran a deficit after the war. Now, when I point this out to Republican partisans, they say, well, yeah, it's not the president. Well, then why are you always saying it's the president when you want to say that pres uh, Democratic presidents are, are tax and spend? Yeah, reality is that it is the president and it is the Congress. It's fiscal policy, a point that we make over and over again. People have to understand what's going on and what people are doing to it. It's very weird because the comedian Christopher Titus has a very interesting YouTube video about how people have been duped into thinking that the Republican Party and uh, the, the fat cats that run it have the best interests of poor people in mind. Pretty, it, it's almost worth interesting, uh, worth finding. Two books, The Banality of Evil. This was written by Hannah Aaron after she had witnessed and reported on the trial of Adolf Eichmann in the early 1960s after he had been caught in Argentina, squirreled out of the country by, by Israeli agents and uh, put on trial in, in Israel. And her point was to see with Eichmann how ordinary he could see the destruction of 12 million people and Europe, you know, six million Jewish people, victims of the Holocaust, but another six million gays and gypsies and Catholics and political opponents were slaughtered by the Nazis too. And Eichmann sort of sat on top of all of that, and he was very calm with it. He was very banal, if you will, about doing it. One of Hannah Arendt's Students at Columbia has written a book called The Evil of Banality, um, which is an interesting topic, but I found it difficult to read the book. It was just a few years ago that it came out, and she focused on the extent to which ordinary people supported the Nazi party 
and let it go away with it and say, yeah, okay, that's fine. Yeah, whatever you want to do. They were very banal about supporting the evilness that was going on. But this book is definitely timely at this point. Another book that's timely is The End of America by Naomi Wolf. This came out around 2006, 2007, and it was concerned with the, the systematic deconstruction of democratic protections and republic protections of the republic and the, the rule of law in the United States. It was a very timely book back then, and it's a very timely book now. After the 2004 election, one of my silver investor clients actually bet me that there wouldn't be an election in 2008. He bet me 10 ounces of silver. The election came and he gave me one. Um, he's not my client anymore. But there were mounting evidence of the deconstruction of protections of civil liberties in the United States. And Naomi Wolf uh, wrote this book. She's kind of gone off the deep end with the COVID and the anti-vaccine scenes and stuff like that. But this was a very good book, and it was very so good. We, we, I bought dozens of copies for people. But one of our, our clients that is a large uh, retail uh, uh, seller of precious metals investments was handing out this book with every order over like $100 or so. Very much uh, worth reading. And it's a smaller book, and it's easier to digest than uh, Hannah Arendt's book. That's all I have for now. Get back to focusing on gold and silver and the economic environment as it affects them next Tuesday. In the meantime, have a good weekend. Have a productive weekend. Um, do something that makes you happy. Do something that's good for yourself and good for those around you. And try to do something good for the world. And we'll talk to you next Tuesday.